Thank you, Mrs. Gandhi, for uh, reminding us of the things we may have lost and what could be different and reimagining India. If I may ask you a few questions. Firstly, I want to know, uh, now that you've given up the presidency of the Congress Party, are you, how do you feel? Are you no, uh, relieved, overjoyed, nervous? I am, I, I am actually relieved. A huge sort of weight is now off my shoulder. I have much more time to do things which I could never do before, uh, to read, perhaps to watch a movie. And I have a lot of uh, work at home in terms of uh, old papers uh, belonging to my uh, husband and some to my mother-in-law. And I'm trying to uh, accessorize and then digitize all those papers. Uh, these are papers, you know, for instance, letters that my mother-in-law used to write to her son, to Rajiv, okay. in school, wow. and his reply. So I think they are, well, from a sentimental point of view, they are important. Uh, they've just been kept for so long. I'm now uh, trying to tidy them up. But actually, are you going to stay out of politics? Because, in fact, you're hosting a dinner on the 13th, calling no, all I, the political I actually, parties I, I am no for longer, uh, organizing a third front, maybe? I am no longer uh, the president of the party. But yes, I, I am the chairperson of the Congress, uh, of the CPP in Parliament, of the Congress party in Parliament. And uh, I do, yes, I do sort of meet with, uh, uh, together with some, with Rahul and some colleagues. Uh, we do have, uh, we try to have regular meetings with, uh, we call them like-minded party. Okay. Uh, to see if we can work together. We have worked together in the past. In Parliament, with, there is a certain amount, uh, especially in the Rajya Sabha, of coordination. Uh, yes, I do that, and uh, I think we are holding a dinner also next week with all, all these leaders um, who lead. Are you hopeful that uh, these parties who have you know, fought with each other quite bitterly sometimes, can actually get together because they see uh, BJP as a big colossus which can't be beaten singly by any party? Well, I, it is difficult for all the parties, I mean, including for ours, because while we can get together at the na national level on some issues or legislations or issues, but at the ground level, we are opponents. So there is a lot of pressure from every party, from my party, from the party of, of another uh, leader, like for instance in West Bengal, in many other states. Um, so it is a difficult task, but I think if all of us uh, think of the larger picture, um, you know, if we think, really think and care for the country, then we, uh, we should uh, think, uh, you know, local dif other difference, which really deal with state politics. What is the advice you have perhaps given to the Congress president, who happens to be your son, but yeah, he's well, the Congress he, president. He is now I'm the leaving. Congress president. Do you he give him fully, any advice? He's fully responsible, you know, he's, uh, he knows uh, what his responsibility uh, are. And, uh, well, I'm there if uh, any sort of advice or thing uh, I can... I Do you can volunteer it or only when he asks for it? Well, it can be both ways. I know my children don't listen to me. Does he listen to you? No, I, I think <laughs> I try not to volunteer because, after all, you know, we parents tend to always try to keep them under control, but I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's not terribly wise to do that always. It's better to let them, I don't know, I, what, what did you do with your uh, father? <laughs> <laughs> he let me be. <laughs> he let me be. He let you be. He let me be, yes. Good. And I think, 
I think it was the right That's decision. That's you are. That's <laughs> why you are where you are, right? But would you, um, uh, I mean, Rahul Gandhi is, is uh, taken up a very big post in, um, after you, after 20 years. Um, how do you see him? Um, is your, his style of management, you think, different from yours? Or are there any disagreements you have with him on particular issues? Look, every, every person and every uh, leader of a party has uh, his or her particular style of working. So, uh, you know, he, he has his style. I had my style. So what's the difference, I mean? No difference, because after all, uh, the Congress party uh, has certain policy, believes in certain ways. I think what he really is keen on, has been keen on, but we have always pulled him back, is to uh, revitalize the party in the sense uh, to have younger people, uh, not to do away with the elders, but to have a balance of younger people uh, and seniors. India is, is these days a very, very young country. Yeah. And I agree with him there. Uh, it's, it's not going to be an easy task, but I'm sure he'll be able to manage. But there's always been a feeling that, um, uh, that you, in fact, wanted the veterans to stay and he wanted young people to come in, and there's always been a kind of a, a tension there between no, he, the two. He, he certainly has always, uh, you know, talked and wanted to have younger people, new people. If you do not have younger and new people, how is your party going to grow? That is his argument, a very valid argument. Uh, then you have uh, the elders or the seniors in the party who feel that, look, we have been struggling all these years, and now suddenly, you know, uh, what's going to happen to us. But in the last uh, meeting we had, um, a working committee, very recently, actually it was turned into the standing committee for the plenary, he clearly said at that meeting that he uh, strongly believes that yes, young people must be encouraged, must be in the party, but uh, that does not mean doing away or you know, ignoring uh, the seniors who have been in the party for long, who have worked and contributed to the party for long. See, in 2004, Congress ruled 13 states and BJP only six. And today, BJP is in 21 and Congress is in four. Yes. So BJP, of course, calls it Congress Mukt Bharat. What do you think happened? What went wrong with this in kind of... In 2004? No, I'm saying this decline that you were ruling 13 states, and uh, you're down to four now. Yes. Right? So what went wrong with the Congress well, party? Well, first of all, uh, we were in government for two terms, and definitely there was a certain amount of anti-incumbency. People felt perhaps they wanted a new person. Uh, there were other issues. And also, I think we were in a way out-marketed because we, we, uh, we couldn't really, uh, you know, compete with the kind of, uh, not propaganda, with, with, with the way uh, under Mr. Modi the party uh, went into elections. So how do you intend to fix that? Well, we have to. It's a challenge, but uh, I'm sure that we'll be able to meet it. So what are the other lessons for you for 2019 elections, which are, uh, you know, what are the chances you think of Congress party in the, in the coming general election, say, next year? Um, what is going to be different? What are the lessons you've learned from the last election, 2014? Well, there are so many lessons, I can't begin to list them out here. Just three. <laughs> <laughs> I think that our party has to uh, really develop a new style of um, connecting with people. Yeah. I'm talking of at the organizational level. And then, uh, of course, we, we have to also, uh, you know, look at, at the way we project our programs, our policies. 
a lot of your policies and programs, in fact, have been adopted by the, yes, the new government. So, the I mean, NDA has adopted, but uh, to begin with, they did. But then, in some cases, they sort of, uh, you know, weaken certain uh, of our some of our of pro programs that we thought were important. But I mean, it is their take. They are in government now, and so. So corruption was the main issue in 2014, I think. Uh, yes. Would that, you agree with that? Uh, uh, that was an, an issue, but I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be here um, misunderstood. But it was uh, highly exaggerated. Now, in the case of the 2G, for instance, right. you must have yeah, uh, they, they recently yeah. what happened. Or, for instance, um, in the in the, pre, the previous uh, CAG right. in our government, they had they came out with some humongous sum of money, which was supposed to have been sort of yeah one like seventy two thousand yes, or something. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it was uh, you know there there was a problem there. Uh, I think now everyone realized that it was not just highly exaggerated. And then the question that we can really ask ourselves, how come uh, the person who was in charge of that institution was given a very cushy job mm -hmm. right after? So, you know, one must think about these things. And then um, in the Gujarat government, I think the oil and gas corporation or something, was, it was called, uh, the, the present, the very institution, CAG, has found 20,000 crores, uh, sort of, I don't know, I don't want right. to use okay. a vulgar word for it, mm. but uh, of uh, misuse, misuse of, of funds. Yes. And, uh, but nobody is talking about it now. We try to take it up in Parliament, but invariably we are not allowed to speak. And that is why, unfortunately, we have to then start making a nuisance of ourselves and shouting because we, every time, any time there is an issue, an important issue that we want to discuss, they find a way of scuttling it, our... But actually, more often you see Congress banging the tables and shouting but and not allowing see, the... Recently, with the yeah, Prime Minister I, not I, being allowed I, to speak. I, I, Do you approve I, of this? I, um, I agree with you. But there is a reason for it. When you have a genuine issue that you want to discuss, and you, you, know, you follow all the procedure, you give in to the speaker or in the advisory committee meeting, uh, you give uh, as per procedure what is the point that you want to discuss under which particular rule, we are just sideline. We are not allowed. At times we have even agreed to change the discussion under the uh, rule which government wants. But even then, take for instance of late, just these last few three days, we wanted to discuss the big uh, fraud. It's an important issue. It's an issue that is agitating people's mind. It is an issue that must be agitated in Parliament. We have simply not been allowed to speak. But just before that, the uh, so, Prime Minister yeah. was trying to speak just after the budget, you remember, and he was not allowed to speak. You know, the, the yeah, Congress. there's a reason for that. Yes, what was the reason There is for a that? reason for that. No, he, he spoke, yeah. but there was a noise from, from the opposition side. It's because when our leader of the party in Parliament who is a senior person, uh, pretty capable, he was trying to speak the previous day. The Treasury benches did not allow him to speak. They shouted and screamed, they called him names, and that is why. So how is this going to be fixed? Because it cannot, politics seems to be, uh, become cannot, very acrimonious. It cannot be fixed and with, with, the, with, the present, with the way the present government uh, is is running parliament. It cannot be fixed. It's impossible because they are not willing to allow us to speak. Now, what is parliament for? 
Is it not a forum where all yes, of us... Yes, of course. We might as well shut down and go home then, if you know. But why aren't you... And, and I'm truly aware... I am aware that, uh, that people at large are constantly angry with the Congress because they feel they are shouting, they are making a noise. Yes. But there is a very serious reason for it. Parliamentary rules are not followed. No, but there is, uh, I'm sure, a way to, to do this um, in the back room to come to some sort of a consensus to say, okay, you, uh, we'll hear you speak and you let us speak. Uh, how long can the country bear this? That, that the present uh, situation is such where there isn't that kind of accommodating spirit. It is not accommodating, it is our right. It is the right of an opposition. I mean, we worked very well when uh, Prime Minister Bajpayee was there. It so was what do you see the difference government. between Prime Minister Bajpayee and Prime Minister he Modi? He had great respect for parliamentary procedure. And Mr. Modi does not. And he's, and, and he's uh, the, the then, the then uh, speaker was what a speaker ought to be. So you what, ought to hear both sides. So what is, uh, okay, let me ask you a straightforward question then. What do you think of Mr. Modi, Prime Minister Modi, as a person? I've just... As, I've, <laughs> no, that you've talked about what I've maybe... I've just you, read out the uh, full Ramayana and you're asking me about no. Sita and Ram. I'm asking you, actually, I mean, you said what, all what he's done, but as, as a person, because you've meet, met... I don't from, know him. You don't I know don't him. I don't know the person. Uh, I, I mean, we see him in Parliament or occasionally let function, but I can't say I know him because there, is, there has never been, you know, kind of... So are you saying that this kind of acrimony which has come in politics now uh, is because of the personalities involved. It's not because of any great ideological I, difference. I do not want to comment on this, but I'm just saying that we were in opposition when Prime Minister Vajpayee was there. Uh, we were uh, bitter opponents yeah. because it was the BJP and things were also beginning a little bit to not to be quite so. Hmm. But we functioned well. Of course, there were disagreements at times, but on, on a whole, on, it, was, we, it was a much more positive way of, and there was give and take. There were, uh, you know, backroom kind of um, compromises in, when, when it comes to uh, being allowed to speak, to debates, etc. So you're painting quite a gloomy picture looking forward that, I mean, this whole year we're going to see just this shouting matches going on between uh, and no real debate uh, I hope happening. Not, uh, I hope not, but what happened now is that the BJP supporters, like the TDP, the TRS, the mm. Shiv Sena, have now started going into the well of the house and representing, shouting and screaming. Their own people. So they're taking the role of yours, which is opposition, is it? <laughs> Yeah, so we sort of just, well, you know, I don't see, unless something major happens, some, uh, I don't see much, uh, much improvement in the situation. So what do you think will be the main issue in 2019, uh, in the general election, the next general election? What would you like to project as the main issue? As corruption was in 2014, do you think Mr. Modi has, has eliminated well, corruption, or is it, will that still be an issue? Or will it be something else? I guess, you know, 20, the, the main issue with, with, our, uh, with the BJP is that uh, they made huge, fantastic promises. But what is being uh, implemented? You know, they sold um, such a picture, such such a positive picture, we'll do this, we'll that, we'll give jobs, I'll give you 15 lakhs rupees, and you know, and uh, there is great, I think, disappointment. 
So what would be your... And I really think that I am confident, really, that, uh, you know, maybe, or, no, I, I am confident, I said that uh, the BJP Achedin will actually have turned into the shining India, which <laughs> is what brought us victory. <laughs> What would be your earnest advice to Mr. Modi if you were to advise but him? But would he ask for, an, for advice? Well, I'm, not, I'm asking you. I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> think... Yeah. He may not ask for it, but I'm, I'm asking you, what would you advise him I to the benefit of the country? I, what would you like him I to do? I wouldn't dare, I wouldn't dare advise him. <laughs> I'm sure he has people around him who probably advise him. I know, him. I know, but I'm saying you, sitting on the opposite side of the bench, uh, would like to see things done differently. Uh, so if he was to give you an ear, uh, what would you advise him? No, uh, he is the Prime Minister after all. I can't advise him, can I? Apart from the fact that I doubt very much that he asks any of our lot advice. <laughs> Will you be fighting the 2019 election in, from uh, Raibareli? Certainly the party, uh, whatever decision the party takes about me. Okay. Yeah, the party so if, you're, if the president offers you that you say yeah, that, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's good. And what, what is this constant cries of Priyanka wanting to join politics? Is that, you're going to put an end to this or uh, is she the, going to come into politics? Priyanka always comes comes out during the election to run, to manage at least my I election, know, she always that, yes. manages. Yeah. And also, uh, I think last time, also part of Rahul's. So that is really That's what her role. Does. At the moment, uh, she has these two big children who are doing exams and she's very preoccupied with a lot of work. But it's, it, you know, it is up to her really. You don't see her joining uh, once her children are grown up and gone to... I mean, I, uh, I don't see it now, but uh, one never knows in the future. I, I don't know, really. Do you, do you tell your children, do this, do that? I do, but they don't listen. That's it. <laughs> How do you react when Rahul Gandhi is attacked personally? You know, recently he's attacked about going to see his grandmother during the uh, Northeast elections. Is that well, a... That, that's not exactly uh, how it is. Uh, yes, he went to see his grandmother, but he had done all his round of electioneering. And uh, after, during that gap, post-electioneering, while you wait for the results, then he went, yes, for three days. Do you see that as an issue because BJP um, leadership seems to be a 24 by 7 leadership. All the time they're thinking, breathing, living politics. Uh, Rahul is inclined to take breaks or go away from it. Uh, maybe that's a different culture in the moment he's in Singapore. Uh, is that yeah, a... Yeah, but he's in Singapore for work. He's not in Singapore. I know, but the, I mean, the, his constituency is India, really. Uh, yes. His constituency, in a larger sense, is India. Um, so, what I'm saying is that the Modi government is a 24 by 7 political machine, and, and Congress seems to be a far more relaxed mode of operation. Do you see that an issue, or is this the way we no, will I continue? Don't see, I don't see that as an issue at all. Of course, now he's become the president, but uh, I can tell you. There are plenty of people in our party who take off yeah. for holidays in between. That's fine. Because we never knew, uh, I mean, you never hear about it. I know about it. You never right. hear about it. That's fine. Let me uh, take you back a little bit in terms of, uh, because it's something which has always fascinated me, is your transformation from what you were and what you've become. I think this is the one of the greatest transformations I've seen in my 40 years in journalism. It's you and now recently it's Naveen Patnaik. That means you started off with somebody who was not even, I remember in one interview you were saying that 
when you first met Mrs. Gandhi, uh, Rajiv presented you to Mrs. Gandhi, that you, she spoke to you in French because you were not even comfortable in English at that time. Yes, because I had just gone uh, to Cambridge and I was, my English was absolutely nowhere. I was just beginning to learn English and yes, she spoke to me. So from that time to the point where you were become a political leader, you speak in Hindi, you give speeches in Hindi. What has been the biggest challenge in this journey for you? Well, there have been many, many, many challenges. Uh, Hindi, I actually, my mother-in-law used to try and make, you know, ask us to speak Hindi at home. But then I went to, there was a very small Hindi institute in uh, Green Park in Delhi. Right. And I attended that, uh, some courses there. But I must say, then I sort of neglected my, you know, our bad habit of, of speaking English more than Hindi, which I wish it was the other way around. But then I slowly, because of that initial course, where I learned, of course, reading, writing, reading, and right. grammar and all, uh, then uh, because of that course, it's that course that helped me when I had to speak publicly in Hindi. Um, it was very difficult at the beginning, but slowly, slowly, I, well, I, I learned. Public speaking is not my fault, as you all know. No, no, but it's, you've done very well. And I'm, Hindi, yeah. and in Hindi, is even more, for me, you know, stressful. And this reluctance of being a, but of I getting speak in, Hindi. Yes, yeah, you speak very well. Yeah. And, uh, and, no, this reluctance of, of, of even discouraging Rajiv Gandhi to become a, the, enter politics. Yes. Um, and uh, there's always been a resistance to it, of you entering, uh, even when yeah. you wanted to enter politics. Yeah. Now you've overcome all that. I mean, you, you uh, enjoy it now, is it? There, there were reasons for me uh, not wanting my husband to join politics. Um, because, you see, when you are in politics, then if you are a genuine person and if you genuinely, genuinely care, then everything comes second. So with Rajiv, Rajiv Jin, those days he used to have a few flights and it was more yeah. of a leisure time and we had small children. We were a, a very happy family. And I felt that, you know, if he joined politics, then it would be the end of that. But uh, then, of course, when after my mother-in-law was assassinated, I, I really didn't want him to, to take that position. Uh, I suppose it was perhaps selfish, I don't know. But I also felt that they would have got him also, which in... They would have, sorry? They, they would have killed him. Oh. Because that was soon after my mother-in-law's, mm -hmm. and there, was, there were lots of threats. And uh, I was right, it did happen. You mean you had a premonition? That yes, this... yes. Really? Not a what? premonition, but I knew what was going on around us, and uh, kind of, you know. So I thought, I felt that, but at that point it was inevitable. He could not have stepped back because already he was already in politics. And after his uh, tragic death and you getting into politics, that must have been a very difficult time for you. I mean, what, yes. was, what, did, what went through your I, mind at that time? Shall I join? Shall I not yeah, join? I, I spent, I think, six or seven years to myself. I wasn't, uh, there was no way I was going to get into politics. I think also my children needed my, up but it wasn't just that. I just did not want to join politics. And then uh, after six or seven years when the Congress was, was uh, going through a very difficult time. Some people were leaving the Congress. And so I, I really felt that I was being sort of a coward not to at least try to do something to, to see if I could help the party. And that's how it went. That's what got you. That's how it went. Do you think the Congress party would survive without a Gandhi at its leadership? 
Gosh, that you have to ask uh, the party, I suppose. What is your opinion? Meaning, from my side, I think that it would all splinter up. There has been a Because tradition. nobody seems to agree on any one leader. There has to be, there has been a tradition in our party. Uh, we are all elected, as you well know, democratically. Yes. Uh, now you see in other countries, whether the Bushes, whether the Clinton, or even at the state level. Um, I don't know. I, but I mean, you know, the, the Democratic Party survives the Clintons, the Republican survives the Bushes. But will the Congress Party survive without the Gandhis? Will there be a, is there a chance of any other leader being there? Why not? In future, they may well be. So you don't think you're the only glue which is for the Congress Party? <laughs> this is a tough question. <laughs> There are many congressmen out here, you can ask them. The other thing which I always... And women. <laughs> yeah, always, the other thing I always wondered was, is how when in 2004 you were elected, you got... Uh, UPA came back and you chose Dr. Manmohan Singh as the Prime Minister. Um, how did that relationship work? Because it was said that Prime Ministers are in office, but you were in power. Uh, yeah, so you had this diarchy, um, meaning there was a kind of, uh, he was always over, overlooking his shoulder. Can you run a government like this? And why didn't you become prime minister? But I don't think it was that kind of situation. Why didn't you become prime minister? Because I think Dr. Manmohan Singh would have been a better prime minister than myself. But you haven't tried. Without trying even, <laughs> I, I knew my limitations. What do you see as um, the future of the Congress party in, um, say, the, the upcoming elections? Say, there's going to be happen in Karnataka, soon it'll be in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, are you very hopeful of that? Yeah, in uh, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. In Rajasthan, recently we yeah. won two um, by elections, or three one assembly and two Lok Sabha. And, in, uh, and then uh, recently, some local elections were, we did very well in Rajasthan. We won two assembly elections now in Madhya Pradesh, though not much was heard about it. And uh, of course, now uh, Karnataka is a very important uh, state for us. We have to do our best to, to return to government. Um, our people there are, they are quite confident, but I always feel it's better not to be too confident. You have to carry on working very hard till the very last day. The Congress Party has always been a hold all of all kinds of ideologies, right? I'd like to know what is your thinking? What is your political philosophy, economic philosophy? Where do you stand? Do you stand to the left? Are you a so Nehruvian socialist? Are you in the center? Um, what are your views in terms of the role of the public sector, uh, how the country should be run in terms of a political philosophy? Well, I am a congresswoman. And uh, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, growth is important, progress, development is very important. And at the same time, it is as important to see to it that those who are less, who don't have, uh, are also receiving support. Because you can't have just one island, as you rightly yeah. said, of very wealthy people and then a huge number of people very poor. Because that, that calls for, for social uh, you know, there could be unrest for social unrest. So a balance of the two. Because, I mean, your government, your party was responsible for the first liberalization of this country. Yes. Uh, and and then, during uh, Manmohan Singh Ji, we had the highest uh, growth. growth ever, I think. 7.5 or, or yeah. something. But you were also uh, a government which gave a lot of 
rights to people, right to education, right to food, but the question yes. is that if you don't but have the that, money... That's precisely... No, I think that was a myth. There was plenty of money. There's always plenty of money to lend to big daddies, if, you, if I may um, call them so. Okay. And whenever there is, a, you know, a requirement for money for, for the poorer section, there is always a noise. The money is there. The money was there. So, I mean, let's look so at an specific, people, ex specific issues like nationalized banks. Would you like to denationalize some they, of these banks? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to, uh, you know, to uh, comment on this because it's, as of now it's not in my, uh, it's not my call. But uh, in the past, I'm talking the, in the past, they have served the country well. I mean, a poor person could go, or no support, middle-level person could go and uh, borrow money. But it's, I mean, we're seeing that the uh, chickens have come home to roost, that a lot of the money which, besides being given to uh, large industrialists which they don't pay back, uh, there are, of course, in the past been loan mailers, there's been loan waivers, so it's all taxpayers' money going down. Um, is it an efficient way to run the economy? I think you would have to ask an economist, uh, Chidambaram, for instance. Okay. Dr. Manmohan Singh, for instance, even better. I, I am not uh, really an economist. I can't. But, but I, there, are, there are flaws. And I think uh, probably uh, some, yes, yeah, some work is needed to get rid of those flaws, to ensure that, you know, do you believe in minimum government? I Meaning government should play a less intrusive role in people's lives? I believe in, in a balanced, in a balanced uh, government. I don't believe in minimum, maximum. Balance is always the best way. So if you were to come to power in 2019, what are the things you would do which you didn't do in the 10 years you were in, in power? What are the, what is, what is I it that you would offer the people? I, what I, would be the agenda? I think, I think we offer the people a great deal during the UPA government. It is just that the opposition was much better at, you know, at, at their uh, uh, communication and uh, we were not able, we did not communicate enough to the people about all the good work that was done. Yeah. So and marketing, you're saying again. Yes, marketing. But marketing is very expensive, isn't it? But Congress has never been short of money before. Well, well, um, you can see the other side is Are not you broke short. now? The other, <laughs> side, the other side is not short of money. I won't go into that. But I think if we proceed in the same way, with the same, you know, not exactly the same pro programs, with some innovation on the programs that we had, I think basically it should be that. And then, of course, lots more. You haven't thought of really what would be your main push No, they are working. In, in fact, on they, 2019. Are, they, are, they are various groups now who are sitting down and working out on a manifesto uh, consulting uh, different section of... Uh, I mean, the, you know, Mrs. Gandhi had Garibi Hatao, uh, the BJP, no. Bajpai government had Shining Movement, Modi government had Ache Din, right? Um, so what's 2019 for yours? I can't say because we have to uh, work on that. We haven't finalized on... But, you know, slogans... I'm not too fond of slogans and empty promises and, you know, mm. jumlas kind of thing. Okay. What do they mean? What are these jumlas? If you go into elections, you don't lie to people and, and you know, uh, sort of offer to them or tell them that you are going to do things for them that you know you can kind of never, do. you would never be too able to implement. But all politicians do that. Many politicians do that. I always try not to. Not to, okay. But yes, it is, uh, 
it is very <laughs> very with politicians it's it's some of them do it well in in this in this particular party uh, this is what they're doing because even today they're promising they're making promises which they know they cannot implement tell me uh, what do you see uh, about the Congress with Rahul went in Gujarat elections, started visiting a lot of temples, and start of now we're looking at something called a soft Hindutva from the Congress side. Is this a deliberate effort in, Look, from the, the, the Congress the to kind of change its image? The BJP has managed to sort of, in a way, I would say, I don't say brainwash because that's, that's a bit of a rude word, but has managed to convince, to persuade people that the Congress party is a Muslim party. Now, I ask, in, in my party, the majority, I mean, the great majority is Hindu and different, uh, you know, section of, but yes, there are Muslims. So I, I fail to understand this, you know, branding us as a, com as, as a um, sort of Muslim party. Well, I mean, so there's been appeasement. We have of always been to temples. I, when I used to travel with Rajiv, I don't know, we used to go, wherever we went, there was always at least one major important temple which we would visit. But we never made a show of it. It was quite natural, you know, you go and. Mm. Um, in the case of, Ra of Rahul, it's gone, yes, to many temples. It's gone before to temples. So you're saying and there's no shift in this, or no deliberate thrust in this direction? I don't think so. In order to kind of say, okay, we're, uh, BJP cannot monopolize this whole Hindutva movement. We're also part Hindu. Maybe there is, there is a bit of that. There is a bit of this. Because we have been pushed into a corner with that, you know. Right. And so, uh, perhaps rather than going to a temple uh, quietly, then maybe, yes, a little more of uh, focus on that, public focus on that. you have any views on what's happening to Karthi Chidambaram uh, in terms of this investigation? No, I, I think and the so whole forth. thing is in, in court there. But I, this I can say, as I said in my speech, that one of the means of, you know, uh, sort of getting at people, uh, at opponents we have seen with this government, is to, to start cases on them. Now, I don't know the details, the particular details of this, but there have been so many other cases where we know that there is nothing, but they then, you know, once, you go, the CBI can very easily find anything in any, even uh, the perfectly clean situation. Last question, Mrs. Stani, is give us what you see the future as. Are you optimistic about India? You think India has a great future, um, regardless of which political party you're from? No, I, I am very optimistic and I have great faith in the people of India. But I am worried, as I have said in my speech. I am worried. At the same time, I am optimistic. And I know that uh, will come through. And if the BJP comes back in 2019, or NDA comes back, would that be a well, let us see. change your outlook? No, I, we are going to come back. We are not going to let them come back. On that note. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Gandhi.